Hey, everybody. Hola, hola a todos. Bienvenidos a Latino Conservation Week's Agua es Vida virtual panel. Thanks so much for joining or from watching from wherever you are. My name is Melanie Garate. I use she, her, ella pronouns, and I'm a Latino Outdoors leader of the Boston chapter. And I'm very excited to be your host for this evening and moderator for this amazing panel discussion we'll be having. I'm calling in from the Boston uh, area on colonized Massachusetts and Pawtucket land. I work in the intersection of climate justice, water science, coastal resiliency, and education and policy. And because I'm so dedicated to my community, I am happily part of Latino Outdoors, which is a national uh, network of volunteers and leaders who are taking initiative to get our Latinx community outdoors. At Latino Outdoors, we inspire, connect, and engage Latino communities. We embrace cultura and familia as part of our outdoor narrative, making sure that our history, our heritage, and our leadership are valued and represented. We have chapters all over the country. I'm in my humid home in the Boston area right now. And we also love to partner with various initiatives that center the voices of Latinos, Latinx, Latinas, um, one being this is what is happening today, Latino Conservation Week. And so Latino Conservation Week, Disfrutando y Conservando Nuestra Tierra is an initiative of Hispanic Access Foundation. So we have lots of events going on this week through Latino Outdoors, but we also, um, but um, Latino Conservation Week is part of a bigger, much bigger network where so many entities, organizations, community groups are uh, participating in activities to protect our natural resources. And so during this week, communities from across the country host events in all of these initiatives, from hiking to camping to film screening and to this right here, Agua Es Vida virtual panel. So this provides an opportunity for us to show our support for permanently protecting our land, water, and air. Uh, Christian, our wonderful behind the scenes guru, will be dropping some links into the chat and putting them within any information that is attached to this. So you can find out more both about Latino Outdoors and about Latino Conservation Week. And so what we're going to talk about today is water issues. So we have water issues in the, in the whole um, United States, um, all over the world. But water issues such as drought, access to safe and clean drinking water, climate change impacts on our coastal communities hit Latinx communities and other communities of color disproportionately. And we are also vastly underrepresented in the aquatic scientists. And so today we're going to talk to some of these leaders who are helping to close those gaps um, in those particular fields. And so as a fellow, fellow Latina um, marine biologist and overall water enthusiasts love all things to do with cold, with water, even cold um, North Atlantic water. Um, I am thrilled to introduce you to three uh, leaders in the water space. They are multifaceted, inspiring, have so much um, uh, expertise up their sleeve and talent, and really un orgullo latino. So first up, I'll give a quick intro to each, which is really not going deep into the, the amazingness that they are. Um, and then we'll open it up to a few questions. So first we have Chachi Claire, also known as Dancing Biologist. Say hey. <laughs> um, she <laughs> is, hey. <laughs> she is a marine biologist and a performing artist. Um, no big deal. She's also um, doing a PhD right now where she examines the impacts of climate change on fisheries while using her cultural and artistic lens to make nature more accessible. Really need to look her up. She's amazing. Um, Melissa Cristina Marquez is also here with us today. Say hey. Hola. <laughs> <laughs> She's a shark biologist, a PhD candidate as well, all the way in Australia. So thank you so much for joining us. And a published children's book author and host of Conciencia Azul podcast. Um, we're so glad to have you today. Thank you so much. And last but not least, we have Jose Aranda. Say hey. Hola a todos. <laughs> he currently works for Water Hub as a relationships manager where he oversees advancing water equity across communities um, 
and that is what is at core of his work. Uh, he his also has background in communications and um, has has done um, various works in that regard, as well as so many um, other things. All of you all are just so amazing. Again, so multifaceted, and I'm so excited uh, to have you on here with Latino Outdoors. Um, we will also share any contact information um, through social media so that way you can get in contact and start following and getting more amazing tidbits of, of their life and information. Uh, so I'll, I'll begin with, with one question. So we have just a couple of questions prepared and we'd love to, at the end, take questions from the audience. And the first couple of questions, um, we want to make sure to hone in on your background, what brought you here today, and then spend a, a little bit of more time with the third question, focusing in on hope. So first question, and you can just um, raise your hand um, if you want to answer the question first. So first, we all know that you all care deeply about water, right? In various in various ways, um, and conservation at all levels. Could you share your entry point and your connection to water? Whoever wants to go first. Melissa, I can go first. I see your hand up. <laughs> I can go, go first. Ahead, Melissa. Um, for me, I was born in Puerto Rico, which is a Caribbean island off of the United States. And my first memories were of me in the ocean. And so the, the ocean's kind of always been a part of me. The water has always been a part of my life. Uh, you know, it's the first memories. It's uh, where I've had some of my best memories uh, happen. And so, yeah, the ocean's kind of always just been a part of me. And uh, I attribute that to me being an island baby. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you for sharing. If I have a follow-up question to you, though, how did you get involved with sharks? <laughs> oh, She's our resident shark biologist. Uh, I've just always been fascinated by misunderstood predators, and sharks are one of the most misunderstood, if not the mis most, or if not the most misunderstood. <laughs> Amazing, thank you, Jose. Um, I I guess uh, uh, my entry point to to environmental um, conservation was was actually in in my family. Uh, my uncle was a, a a biologist, and he was a uh, one of the uh, first uh, researchers to to work on the on the Lacandon jungle. I'm from Mexico. The Lacandon jungle is the southeast, like the Mayan jungle. Ah. And so he was uh, doing Christmas Christmas family gatherings. <coughs> By the way, I'm recovering from COVID, so I'm, I have this like lingering coughing. <laughs> so sorry for that. Uh, um, but during Christmas gatherings, he used to um, show up, show us. Uh, slideshows uh, with his pictures of jaguars and and um, you know snakes and all kinds of uh, wildlife and and that to me kind of like open open up my eyes and my heart to the natural world um, and then years after that um, I was uh, doing communications work as you said um, and I was working with an NGO that was working against illegal mining open sky mining within national parks and in that same region. And that's how I got really invested and, and became more and more interested in, in water justice issues and environmental justice issues. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> uh, just like you, Jose, um, it was the media, honestly. It was photos that really pulled me into the natural world. Um, so while I have coastal roots, mi padre es de Belize, my mom is from Jamaica, you know, my family's from Belize and Jamaica. I'm first gen. I grew up in California, so that's pretty close to the ocean. But I actually spent no time in the ocean growing up. You know, if you have a working family, sometimes trips to the ocean can be really difficult and hard to come by, even growing up here in California. And I actually learned how to swim when I was an adult. Um, but it was those 
moments that I would see um, media and film and that definitely took to me because I was a storyteller from a very early age. I Theater was my discipline growing up and that was my vessel of communicating. So when I saw those images, I kind of clung to books and media. And now that I actually am, you know, a scuba diver, I learned how to swim scuba dive and become a rescue diver all in the past five years. Um, and now that I'm here, it's using media and using arts to kind of bring people in as well. Thanks so much for sharing everybody. It seems like you all have um, such a connection to the water that is really unique in your own, but is also at the same time really speaking to many experiences a lot of people in the audience right now probably share. Uh, so thank you so much for making all of those connections. And I am, I'm wondering, I think, Melissa, you talked to, about this a little bit, but is your work in any way, you know, your current work with water um, or how you started out focusing in on water, um, is that connected to your Latinx or Latino identity at all? And if so, how? And whoever wants to start can feel free. I can start this up. Um, sure. I mean, um, you know, thinking about um, the the Latinox uh, identity is is kind of like tricky. I think it's it's um, complex. Um, and so for me, um, how this started is, um, you know, I, I think of the Latino identity as um, mestizo. You know, a, a mix between uh, our different roots, including our indigenous roots. And, and so for me, um, it was clear that um, at least from, from my limited perspective of, of our society, it is the indigenous route that is um, underrepresented and, and undermined and, and often yeah, ignored. Um, and at the same time, that indigenous route is very deep and grounding and very wise. Um, which is very, very counterintuitive. And so for me, um, connecting with that indigenous roots and indigenous teachings and spirituality was really what, what brought me closer um, to water and, and closer to uh, environmental work, not necessarily from, from a, um, you know, kind of like a, a apocalyptic, oh, we need to fix this, but more, but more from a, <clears throat> this is, this is something that I really care about, that I love um, my, you know, the river where I used to go when I was a kid with my family, um, just um, all the different experiences that I had that, that I learned to value. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, I remember um, going down to local little tiny streams. I'm from Chile originally, um, but, you know, have been drying out over the years and feeling like, oh, this is our little, you know, paradise in our neck of the woods. And then whenever we would go to the big giant ocean, um, it was even more of that paradise. Thanks for sharing. Who else wants to go? Marisa. Yeah, just to um, kind of add on to what Jose said, I, I do think it's, a reclaiming of something that was kind of taken from us in a way um, with those indigenous roots is getting back to nature, how we used to be um, for a lot of uh, Latinos, Latinas, Latinxes. And for me, I mean, I think my connection with nature has every, it is just as intrinsically connected to my Latina identity than anything else, because that is, where I grew to love the ocean was surrounded by my family and friends who spoke Spanish um, and the shores of Puerto Rico, you know, that that is where my love for the ocean came was Puerto Rico. Um, and I think, you know, I could have loved the ocean wherever I was, but I think the associating it with the culture or with the values of my Latinx family. So the culture of community, the culture of family, the culture of leaving a place better than what you found it. Um, th those are values that my family instilled in me. And so 
of course, many other families can instill that as well. But I just think, yeah, it, it is definitely a part of my Latinidad, um, my love for the ocean and how I go about trying to help the ocean is also a part of my Latinidad. Oh, such beautiful answers. And I guess I just want to talk about the title again. You know, water is life. Um, we cannot survive without it. And I think when thinking about my identity, I think about all the stories that I heard from my mom being an island woman and how growing up it is essential. You know, when a hurricane comes, that's connected to the sea, that's connected to the buildings that are gone. And then also what we eat every single day, being in coastal communities, um, water is life. And I feel like for many years, I always felt like Latina in hiding because of all the different complexities around being Afro-Latina and people's ignorance is really understanding of what being Latina looks like. Um, I, Jose, you couldn't have said it better. Uh, a Latinx identity is very complex because we are, you know, una mezcla, we're everything. Um, we're so many different types of people in one. Um, but I agree with everyone that, um, it's the way of seeing the sea. It's the way of our food, our food, everything that we do. Um, I think it's definitely connected. So yes. Thanks so much for sharing just a little piece um, of your journey. I'm sure that there's a lot more to that that we can detangle uh, to get to get to know you a little bit better. So thanks for sharing all of that. Um, I'm going to take this moment to remind everybody who's watching or listening that you can drop questions into the chat from whatever platform you're on right now, and we'll try to get to them in, in the at the end. So we already see a few. Would love to get a few more. All right. So um, this is my favorite question for you all, and this can also be an opportunity for, for you to share a little bit more of the, the work that you are actually doing right now. Um, or any part of that journey. <clears throat> so marine biologist and climate activist um, and my favorite um, all-time inspiration and role model, Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson. If you don't know her, folks, please look her up. She has amazing TED Talks and just is an amazing person. She was recently on the podcast called On Being, uh, where she was sharing a little bit about her upcoming book that she is still writing today. So the potential title for this book is, What If We Get This Right? And this is such a powerful question, and I would love to reflect this question uh, to you all panelists. Uh, I'm wondering, what do you think um, this question means in terms of your work? What if we get this right? What if, we, what if you get right what work you are doing in your neck of the woods? Um, what would that look like? And um, what can we also potentially um, do to, to help get to there? But let's just answer the question, what if we get this right in terms of your work and your vision um, for helping to conserve water um, for the benefit of our communities? Melissa. Um, so as a shark scientist, part of what I focus on is shark habitat use. So figuring out why sharks are where they are, uh, not only to figure out uh, proper management for them, but also proper management in regards to us as well. I think a lot of times people forget for conservation, we're not just trying to manage an animal, we're trying to manage our perception and our relationship with that animal. And so for me, the question of what if we get this right really speaks to what if we get this right, we can actually coexist with predators in our oceans, predators on our land. Um, and I think that is ideal. I mean, that is the future that I'm kind of working for is where we can peacefully or as peacefully coexist with predators as much as possible. Um, they have every right to live on this planet as much as we do. Uh, you know, they were here first. They've been around since even before trees. And so I think if we learn, I, I think to get to that point, we have to switch our mindset, which is we have to 
completely change how we view our relationship with nature. And I think that is what's needed is we need to realize we need to stop taking, taking, taking. We need to figure out ways of how to give back, how to, yeah, just, just coexist with the planet that we call home. And I think if we learn how to coexist with the planet that we call home, we'll be better off because will not be taking advantage of her, will respect her, will realize just how much she's been doing for us and give back. Amazing. Thank you, Melissa. And I think that brings us back to Jose's point too, that, you know, we ha come from these cultures, our indigenous uh, lineage that we're working um, with our nature. So it isn't just that humans are these terrible beings that were ruining everything. I mean, you know, there's a case to be made about that. But at the same time, there was a moment, um, a long moment, um, where we actually cohabited um, this earth um, or this water planet um, with our plant and, and uh, animal um, relatives. And so it's an amazing point that you make. And Melissa, if I could ask you a follow-up question, could you share a little bit, just in case people don't know much about shark biology or why they're important, why predators are important, can you share a little bit about that and the food web and, and whatever comes to mind? Yeah, definitely. Um, so for sharks, it, it's, I mean, they're just incredible animals, uh, but they really matter on three different fronts, which is ecologically, economically, and culturally as well. Um, obviously, with culture, um, they are revered, they are idolized, they are feared uh, by many cultures still today that, I mean, here in Australia is a great example. There are many um, Aboriginal communities that still see sharks as the creators of their specific region, which I think is beautiful. And so culturally, you take those animals away, you're taking part of that cultural heritage, which is horrible. Um, economically, for shark species, I mean, it's millions of dollars that are being brought in worldwide um, for specific areas. And so it, it's, I, I think it's, ooh, what was it? There came out a really good stat recently. I think that it was, um, it's supposed to be billions of dollars um, worldwide that by like 2030, you're gonna have for any kind of shark related ecotourism and whatnot. Uh, right now, I think shark tourism in the US is estimated to be, 315 million US dollars a year with over 500,000 tourists, over 10,000 jobs. So, you know, it's it's employing us, it's employing um, the people who work around those tourist areas as well. And then of course, uh, sharks play an important role in maintaining the delicate balance ecosystems by keeping our oceans healthy. Uh, they have few natural predators and they feed on animals below them in the food web. So they limit the abundance of their prey, which then affects the prey of those animals um, and so on and so forth throughout the food chain. And so they indirectly or directly affect all levels of the food web, which leads to a healthier ocean. So yeah, sharks are very, very important to our planet on a multitude of reasons. Thanks so much for sharing that. I think, again, sharks get a little bad rap, but um, we love sharks. They control the ocean populations in the ocean. And like Melissa said, they're so important for our culture, our economy, and of course, ecologically. So just keep that in mind. Um, we want to keep them there so that way other animals can can also um, reside in the ocean, including animals that we pen depend on economically um, and for food. So thanks so much. Um, Sochi, are you ready to go next? Sure, yes. Um I guess kind of going off our human to ocean resource connections. Um, before I answer the question, my work is exactly kind of in that world where we think about fisheries and we forget sometimes that it's about us. That is the study of how we use the ocean. And when I think of Latino Conservation Week, I think of conserving ourselves. You know, we're looking at the conservation of our planet, but really it's the conservation of ourselves. And so a lot of my work is looking at ocean warming and thinking about how our ocean resources are going to be impacted, hearkening back to what you were saying um, about how there have been moments in time where we've sustainably harvested. 
So while there's a lot going on about, you know, fisheries are bad, it's, well, the way that we are taking our resources could be well improved. And so to answer the question as to what does it mean, when, you know, when we get this right, um, to me, what that looks like is a melting pot of disciplines are welcomed um, because the way in which our ancestors solved these problems in the past was through philosophy combined with, you know, mythologies you're talking about, the reverence that we have culturally. Um, we observed, we did a lot of science um, and those disciplines were melded. It was a way of life. However, now we separate them. And I think we're actually limiting ourselves by a lot um, in actually trying to go forth and solve these problems. So the more that we can blend the way that we look at the world, we can have a better blend of people who can participate in this. Um, culturally, we think on four different planes all at once sometimes uh, in BIPOC communities. So that's the way we do things. And that's the way that we need to start approaching our problems. Amazing. I'm all about collaboration and making sure that we're, we're hearing diverse voices. Um, that diverse voices are at the table because we each bring like look at all of all of the wonderful things that you have all brought to this um, you know just three three panelists uh, discussion and all the breadth of knowledge and lived experience that you share so thank you for bringing up that point that you know us just being in these spaces is radical in itself and it's leading to better outcomes and so we just need more of that thank you so much Jose yeah, <clears throat> kudos to, to that um, multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary um, and, and echoing and lifting up what, what Melissa sh shared about the, the interconnectedness um, of everything, really. Um, I think for me, um, what if we get it right has to do with uh, an, a world in which we kind of like step back or or just go beyond um this vision of the world that is that is um <clears throat> our natural resources this resourcey vision of the world and and we start to be more sensitive and 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 you know open our perception and our sensitivity to acknowledge that um everything around us has a spirit and everything around us um, has a light and, and, you know, a way for us to recover the, the deep uh, respect for um, everything that we share our life with. Um, and I think that, you know, is related to um, human beings being more humble in the world and, and understanding that, you know, the, as, as long as we can um, um, honor and 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 continue to to cultivate relationships between us and and the spirits that um, give life to every species on earth, right? Like uh, that's how I was taught is be, behind each you know um, medicine plant, behind each um, animal, there's a spirit. And as long as we can cultivate relationships to, with those spirits, um, those. Um, uh, species and, and beings will be kind to us and will have compassion on us um, and will be able to help each other out. And so, you know, I, w with all, <laughs> as, as much as I love and respect um, conservation science, um, parenthesis, by the way, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be in, in a panelist with three marine biologists because when I was in, in primary school, my dream was to be a, a marine biologist, and and so I was I was going to move to La Paz in Baja California, and and study marine biologist. And so it's it's kind of like a dream come true. I didn't have to go to La Paz and study to be in a panel with <laughs> marine biologist. Um, but with all you know, with everything that I love about conservation and science, I think that it's it's limited. Um, and it's in its deeper understanding uh, of the interconnectedness of, of all living beings. And I think that, you know, I, I, what, what uh, Sochit 
said definitely re resonates with me, which is that we need um, more people working together from different perspectives. Um, at the same time, I saw there was a, a question in the in the chat about what is one piece of advice for kids trying to get into the field of work, and I, and I would say that as, as there's a balance between having different perspectives and different disciplines and also choosing one where you're going to focus. And I think those two can be in balance. I think that, you know, not everyone needs to do everything and, and it's not even possible. So I, I would suggest, you know, for kids or for those who are start, starting to think about working in, in water and environmental issues is to focus on one thing and that will eventually take you to everything because everything is connected. Thank you so much, Jose. Um, <clears throat> I think um, I love hearing all of these points about bringing in this wide network that we have. And I wonder, Jose, if you can speak to that a little bit more in terms of your current role or your previous role, um, because I do believe you've done a lot of this uh, facilitation work with communities. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, um, one of the one of the things that um, has become very clear is that some some um, as we were saying before, some voices are un underrepresented in in the conservation and in the water uh, space, and those voices are mostly from communities that have been left out, meaning black and brown communities all across the world, um, and so as part of of trying to uh, come up with solutions for that, um, you know, we need more of those voices being elevated and more of those stories and more of those uh, communities uh, being present in the media, in the conversations, in, in policy making, um, and, and in general, part of the conversation. And so one of the things um, that I work on and that I get to facilitate, and I think it's an honor and a privilege is a network of non-traditional experts in water that we call the, the color of water. Um, so, you know, people from indigenous communities, um, people from uh, low income and, and um, urban communities that have been disinvested um, and that experience pollution um, firsthand. Um, those stories we wanna elevate um, through the color of water initiative. Um, and, you know, it's it's, starting but those voices have are also really powerful and inspiring and empowering and really um, um, bringing on uh, a more humane um, um, discourse uh, you know a more a way more um, um, compassionate way to see uh, water issues which are you know are, are not easy and are, <laughs> are not gonna get easier. Uh, we're seeing, you know, heat waves and <laughs> droughts, and um, the way to approach these very harsh times is is through compassion, I believe, um, and that's why what what <laughs> we're focusing on is uh, storytelling, because um, it's it's always, you know, um, the stories that get us closer to each other. Thanks so much for elaborating. I think it's such an important point to make that our stories really matter. And also we're the only ones who should be able to share those stories. They have to come from our perspective, um, from our voices, from our lineage. Um, and that is what will change um, so many systemic problems. Um, all right, so we have about 10 minutes left and I see some questions in the chat. Uh, and Jose, you already asked one of them, so I think we can go around to um, Sochile and Melissa to answer that question as well. What is one your one piece of advice? Could be two. There's never just a one answer to anything um, for kids trying to get into your field of work. Yes, um, I think going off of what uh, was said from Jose, um, I do believe that you can take your ocean interests and you can put them into whatever it is you find that you're good at. So we're going to need historians. Um, we talked about policy. We're going to need uh, lawyers. Um, we're going to need people who are very good in economics, um, very good in business planning, spatial planning, anything that you can think of, coding, computer science, 
all of those disciplines are going to be so important as we move forward in conserving our planet. So if you find that, well, you know what, I'm not a marine biologist, I don't think I'll become a scientist in this way, you can still take, um, you know, literature, writing, we need journalists. Um, so there are so many different disciplines that can come together, um, art as well, um, to, to help us uh, do this. So uh, to the kids, go with what you're passionate about and you can bring the ocean along with you. Uh, and I'll let uh, Melissa take it from there. Yeah, I think kind of going off of the spirit of community, I think finding people who are interested in what you're interested in is really important in just stoking that flame that you have in you in regards to whatever it is that you're interested in uh, for the ocean. So I think having a group of supporters is really important, but also having people who, when you can't seem to find that motivation for that dream or you're just having a really rough day and whatnot, they'll be the ones who are like, no, you've got this, like they're your cheerleaders in a way. So I think, again, finding that support group is really important. And for me, my support group, most of them aren't marine biologists. They're friends that do all sorts of things. Like one of them is a flight attendant. Uh, one of them is an HR advisor. Uh, two of them are my parents. Uh, one of them works in criminology. The other one is a student advisor. Like none of them are in marine biology, but they all know how much it means to me. And they're the ones that I go to ask them questions. They're the ones who give me advice, who pump me up, who every time something of mine comes out, they support it and scream it from the rooftop. So find that people for you because that community is going to get you so, so far. So beautifully put, all of you. Um, and Sochil, I just want to raise up the fact that you're also a dancer, so you're bringing a different expertise um, also to all of the work that you do. And that is what is so valuable. You know, that's just one example. That is what is so valuable about us bringing our whole selves um, and our vast um, lived experience into the, the work that we do in a, in a healthy and productive way. And so you know, when you hear about the climate crisis or the water crisis, you don't hear like, well, we need an artist. Well, we do actually, because we need to get all of this information out to people in various ways. We need to um, communicators. Um, we need scientists who are good at science communication too. Um, so there's so many things that you all have brought to the table. And I'm sure that there's so many things that people listening in the audience can bring to the table, whether it's, you know, being behind the scenes and working on budgets or coding, like we need you. You don't have to be in the front and center. We need the behind the scenes people. Um, so thank you so much uh, for sharing. And I will ask one more question before logging off. Um, we have a question in the chat um, where Luis, hey Luis, um, said, for me, a watershed moment in understanding and valuing our relationship with water was actually learning what a watershed is and understanding that no matter what, where we are standing in the world, we are in one watershed or another, and it's flowing water that connects us all. Um, and it connects us all human and non-human non communities alike. So he'd love to hear about a watershed or aha moment um, from each of the panelists, if we have time to do that. I can I can get us started and and thank everyone um, who made this possible and everyone who who attended. Uh, for me, one of those uh, watershed aha moments um, was uh, sitting down with uh, a watershed um, expert, um, um, a biologist, and and him explaining to me that if we want to solve um, uh, water issues, uh, you got to start at the top of the mountain. Because that is when everything, where everything kind of like starts slowly. If you want to solve them, um, you know, lower in the watershed, it's gonna, it's just gonna be harder. And that's why we get a lot of our solutions wrong. Is because we we think about, oh, we, we just need to build a bigger wall. Um, but in the meantime, you know, if we're losing forest and vegetation that regulates water, um, we're just gonna have to built a bigger wall and a bigger wall and a bigger wall. Um, and so I think that that to me was an aha moment of like, oh, it, it all starts 
uh, at the top of the mountain and you have to build slowly from, from there. We gotta start at the source. Thank you. Melissa. I think for me, kind of my aha moment uh, was realizing how, even if you've never seen the ocean in, the, in your whole entire life, your actions still impact it. And it, it's similar to that watershed aha moment um, that Louise talked about where he said, no matter where we are standing in the world, we're all in one watershed and water connects us all. And I think that's so true to impress that upon people, because if we all kind of realize, regardless of where you are, your actions will have an impact on our planet because we are all on the same planet is so, so, so important. And so I think me learning that and then sharing that message with other people, especially with those who have never seen the ocean in their life and are like, oh, well, why, why should I care about that? <laughs> like, I have nothing to do with it. Really showcasing and showing them like how their actions matter. Um, I, I think changes their perspective on stuff, but also changed my perspective on stuff because it just shows you of uh, that. Uh, I think it's a metaphor or an analogy where one little drop turns into giant ripples. We're all tiny little drops in our own world, creating these giant ripples. Uh, and we all have a sense of responsibility to take care of our planet. So beautiful. Thank you so much. It, it reminds me of the um, emergent strategy series by Adrian Marie Brown, um, talking about how every, every little piece that we do in our, in our cultures, in our homes, in our office environment, then ripple out, you know, even this, the way that we've flowed this, um, panel, um, the things that we've talking about, the way that we've shared space for one another, these are all things that then we bring back, um, into our daily lives and, and into the bigger work that we're doing. So thank you for bringing that up. So too. Yes, and I'll be brief because I know we don't have much time, but um, even if you've never swam, the ocean is keeping you afloat. And that is because the ocean is our, our lungs. Um, they help us breathe. They help the forest breathe. Uh, so that it was is a fact that is well known um, in the ocean space, but it is one that still blows me away every single time. Um, and I actually learned how to float. It took me so long to learn how to float. I mean, it sounds so easy, but it was really hard <laughs> for me. And that was an aha moment. It was the moment of letting go and actually believing that fact that the ocean does hold us up. It really does. Um, and actually physically in my body, seeing that for real was amazing. And when I finally learned it, um, and on the note of community, um, uh, cheerleaders, my mom has been in the chat a lot, so I wanted to say thank you, mom. <laughs> yes. Oh, I love our moms. Hey, mom. <laughs> love that. And thank you, Sochil, for bringing us back to Water is Life, Aguas Vida, um, the ocean and our water systems, all the little plankton, all the little um, um, uh, phytoplankton in the water are actually the lungs of our earth. The ocean represents 60% of the ocean, or sorry, of the oxygen that we breathe. It's actually more than trees. So I was Vida, um, water is life. Thank you so much panelists uh, for joining, for taking time out of your busy lives and different time zones. Melissa also all the way from Australia, you all from California and I'm out here on the East Coast. So now you know how to reach us. And if you want to find out more, go on latinooutdoors.org um, and follow us on social media. Bye everyone. Have a good night. Vamos a la playa.